The power of God that lives in us is demonstrated in his everlasting character. Let's stand together and sing. Everlasting is the Lord our God. Everlasting is the Lord our God. Everlasting is your name. Everlasting King of love and love forevermore shall reign. Everlasting is the Lord, we will worship and adore, Lord Jehovah still the same. Everlasting, strong and true, Lord, we put our trust in you, and with joyful hearts proclaim. Everlasting is your name. Everlasting is the Lord our God, river of eternal grace, most abundant from your righteous throne, washing all my sins away. Everlasting is the Lord, we will worship and adore, Lord Jehovah still the same. Everlasting, strong and true, Lord, we put our trust in you, and with joyful hearts proclaim. Everlasting is your name. Everlasting is the Lord, we will worship and adore, Lord Jehovah still the same. Everlasting, strong and true, Lord, we put our trust in you, and with joyful hearts proclaim. Son, who is our King, who is the Lord of all lords, we thank you for 
the example of his life. We thank you for his sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for his resurrection that gives us the hope of eternal life and a place in your presence. We thank you for your word that instructs us, encourages us, guides us, convicts us, leads us in the path of righteousness only for your name's sake. We thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity to gather today to sing praises to you, to see one another's smiling faces, and we thank you for your goodness. And we give all the praise and honor and glory that belongs to you and your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
Back, back off. Oh, that was great to hear the choir. And uh, if you want to uh, join the choir at any time, they meet on Wednesday nights after the prayer meeting. A um, couple of things I need to update you. I made a mistake in the bulletin. There is no evening Bible study tonight. It got into the prayer bulletin, the change on Wednesday, but not into the bulletin tonight. So there's no evening Bible study tonight. We will do Romans 5 next week. We're also going to have in next week's evening service a brief uh, business meeting in talking about the front wall of the auditorium. We're going to talk the specifics of that. The deacons and elders met last week and talked about that. We want to bring together a proposal for you of whether we want to move ahead on that project and what that would look like and what that would cost and a way in which to fund that. So that'll happen next Sunday night at uh, 6 o'clock, and then we'll have our Bible study in Romans chapter 5. Also, in two weeks, uh, ladies, in your mailboxes is a, is a notice. Um, you are invited. Uh, it's a boy. or a baby shower for Michael and Becca. That is happening in two weeks. That is on February 26th here at the church from 10 to noon. Um, so if you're wondering where Michael and Becca are today, it's their 10-year anniversary, and they are having a staycation away from their children. If, well, they have one of their children with them, but he hasn't made his arrival yet. So, uh, they're, <laughs> so we're excited about uh, what's happening in all of our lives, and we hope you can be part of that. Um, and then there'll be one more announcement that you'll have to wait and hear with bated breath about your children. It's going to come just before the uh, kids' message. Let's continue our singing, Jesus is the light of the world. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, his glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. To the light is shining for thee, sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see, the light of the world is Jesus. No darkness have we who in Jesus we find, the light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our God. Beginning and to end, you're my. 
Revelation 15, starting in verse 5. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. The deliberate nature in which God is unveiling his judgment against mankind is just as deliberative as the story he gave us that his son would come to save us. Let's sing the song. We have a story to tell to the nations. We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy. A story of peace and love. A story of peace shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. We the Savior to show to the nations, who the path of sorrow had trod. truth of God, for the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. Thank you. You may be seated while the kids come up here as we talk about what this God looks like. While the kids are coming up there, I'm going to steal your attention for a quick second. Uh, I apologize, so I'll apologize in advance for the short notice. Uh, but this upcoming Saturday night, if you enjoyed last night, if you were here and had the sweetheart banquet, uh, and you want another date night away from your children, this upcoming Saturday night is a good night to do that. Uh, the SOS group is going to be hosting a child care night here at the church from 5 o'clock till 8 o'clock at night. Uh, dinner will be provided, we'll feed them, we'll have some fun with them, play some games and whatnot. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. Uh, if you could sign up today, that would be great, but if you don't get around to it and you still want to bring your kid come Saturday night, uh, that's totally fine because I had every intention of getting the sign-up sheet out there earlier, but I was in New York City last weekend and you know how that goes, it didn't work out. So uh, hopefully we can see you guys Saturday night. We're looking forward to it. Pay attention. Right. How awesome that you are here. Here's the question. What does God look like? If God was going to show himself to you, what does he look like? What does he, what does he look like? What's he? Um, 
A white robe. Okay, you give us one thing. What else? He looks like a person. Like light. Okay, so we got a robe, we got a person, we got light. What else do we got? Like an angel? Do you know what an angel looks like? Okay, you know what an angel looks like. Okay. He has brown hair. Well, that's getting pretty specific. I was envisioning it white hair because he was old. But then I'm old and I don't have white hair. And then there's some people who are young who have, right, could he be bald? No, no. He never gets old? So what's, what's old? What's young? Yeah. Is his son younger than him? All right, let's move on. We're going to talk a little bit about what God looks like. I have, um, so here's where the Bible tells us what God looks like. So Adam and Eve, remember the story of Adam and Eve, right? They were, they were created by God. They walked around in a garden, and here's what the Bible says. God walked with them. That tells us a lot, right? That he walked with them. Well, here's, here's the next one. The picture up there on the screen. Do you know what story that is? Moses and the burning bush. So God met Moses in a burning bush. And you remember what he told Moses about the whole burning bush? You remember? Huh? Was he allowed to go real close? Was he allowed to just come up and say, hey, how you doing, God? No, God said, take off your shoes because the ground you're standing on is holy. You know what holy means? Separated. That was the ground that God was on. And when God was on that ground, they couldn't be on that ground as well. There's an interesting story. So that same God and that same person, Moses, a couple of probably months later, they're at the place called Mount Sinai. The nation of Israel has come out of Egypt. They're at Mount Sinai. I want to read you a couple of verses where God is going to talk to the nation of Israel. Here in Exodus chapter 24, I've got to make sure I read the right verses. Starting at verse 15, Exodus 24, here's what happened. Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on the mountain, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So Moses goes up on the mountain. A cloud comes down on the mountain, and God talks to Moses out of the cloud. Well, he's talked to him out of a burning bush. I suppose he can talk to him out of a cloud. Now, if you've ever been in a cloud, there's not much to see. Let's continue reading. So here, listen to this. The sight of the glory of God was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So if the nation looked at the mountain to see God, what did they see? Like a fire coming, burning out of the top of the mountain. Like a fire. It's a cloud and it's a fire. There's one more verse here. So Moses went up into the cloud and into the mountain and he was there 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you guys, you guys like campfires? Yeah. Do your parents like you walk into the campfire? No. no, of course not. You get burned. Here's the top of a mountain burning, and Moses goes up into it and disappears for 40 days. Let me read the next part of the story, which happens in Exodus 33. Here's the next part of the story of God showing himself. Exodus 33. Listen to this. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So at one point when Moses went up into the mountain to see God, he actually got to stand in front of God face to face. Now Moses doesn't describe what that looked like, but here's what the rest of the verse says. And he would return to the camp, but his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. You know what's interesting? After Moses saw God face to face, when he came down into the camp, was he changed? Do you remember the story? His face glowed, and not in a nice way, but in a frightening way. Yeah. You know, the Bible in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was not allowed to get near God or touch the mountain or get close 
because God was holy and separated from them. Did it change when Jesus came? Did people get to walk up to Jesus and talk to him? Yeah. yeah. Did people get to walk up to Jesus and touch him? No. Yes. And Jesus touched them? And Jesus talked with them? Did they ever sit down to a meal with Jesus? Yes. Did Jesus ever wash their feet? Yeah. I wouldn't wash your feet. Yeah. Oh, that would be terrible to wash your feet. Especially if you've been walking around outside all day on the farm in bare feet. But Jesus presents God to us so we can see him. So every time we read in the Bible about God and all the stories you hear about God, realize that God says, at some point, I'm going to let you see me, and I'm going to send my son to show you what I'm like. It doesn't matter. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a description of whether he had brown hair or whether he was tall or whether he was short. It doesn't tell us anything about, you know, did he, did he, have, a, did he, uh, did he have good eyesight or bad eyesight? I'm assuming he had good eyesight. It doesn't tell us what the, what, did he have a high squeaky voice or a low deep voice? What it tells us about is how much he loved us, cared for us, and would do things for us. And that's what I want you to understand today. So you can go to Children's Church or you can go back to your families. When I was first looking at Revelation chapters 14 and 15 and into 16, I was assuming, you know, because of the nature of how many words are in those passages, that there would be this chunk of verses that I would go after, and we would just move through this in about three messages. Then I began to actually read it. And I found that there's some profound things in there that take a little more time to consider. And that's where we're at today in Revelation chapter 15. Because since the moment the angel, and you have to go back a few verses... Since the moment the angel who held the everlasting gospel said with a loud voice in chapter 14 and verse 7, Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Since the moment that angel said that, events have now unfolded quickly but very methodically. The judgment on the earth that is presented chapters 14, 15, 16, that judgment is not random violence done by an out-of-control deity. You know, God is just getting so fed up with man, he just blows up. I don't know if you've ever blown up. I've done it two or three times in my life. Regretted each one of those and swore I would get my anger issues under control, and God has been really good to not blow up like that other than very infrequently, maybe every three or four or five years, I have a moment when the frustration boils up and I say something verbally I shouldn't say. That's not God. That's not the presentation here in Revelation 14, 15, and 16, where he's out of control. He hasn't been pushed to a breaking point. He's not lashing out irrationally. We live in a world where where irrational behavior is sometimes paraded, sometimes rejoiced in, where a person just shows their violent tendencies. I mean, cage fighting, and it's not really called cage fighting. Originally it was cage fighting, and it was fake, and it was professional wrestlers. Now it's the octagon, and now people just punch, and, and whatever they can do to destroy another person, it almost seems out of control. They would say they're in complete control. God here, in a methodical way, So let me remind you of them. Babylon has fallen. Why is Babylon fallen? Why is the world system fallen? Why? Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has led the world into wickedness, into sinfulness, into a rejection of God. And God has declared she is defeated. Now he's identified the guilty people. 
In chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, notice what he says. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The people themselves have not fought against the wickedness of the overseeing beast, the world system, the government, the new world religion. They have not fought back against it. They have submitted to it. They've allowed themselves to be marked. They've allowed themselves to be seen as loyal to Babylon and its wickedness. And so God has identified them as guilty. And now he has given the order to begin. So in chapter 14 and verse 15, these are all verses we've looked at before. The order is given. Thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So there's a sense in which God had a methodical plan that when the earth got as wicked as it was to get, that at that moment, judgment would come. When the earth proved that it was not going to repent, that it was not going to turn to God, that it was not going to respond to all the previous judgments that had been leveled against the earth, then now it was time to reap it, for its judgment is full. So now those who've escaped the power of the beast, and how would you escape the power of a wicked world, a wicked system, a wicked political leader, how would you escape them? Well, according to Revelation 14 and 15, through death. It's the only way out. You can't just run and hide. You can't just stay under the radar. You're going to find yourself escaping the power of the world through death. We were talking about it in Sunday school this morning a bit. How far does the world have to go where you're not willing to continue to follow God? Is there a point at which our world might turn upside down enough that you will no longer be willing to follow God? The things we're facing today in our world are not ones that are challenging our faith necessarily. They're challenging our loyalty. We're in a battle. Worldwide, we're in a battle right now. Humanity is in a battle. Will humanity submit to power? That's the battle that's going on across the world. Some nations have already submitted where the populace does whatever the leaders say. But that battle is occurring everywhere. It's occurring everywhere. You know, it's funny, you know, they declare that the Canadians are the most law-abiding citizens, and they can't believe that a bunch of Canadians are rebelling against their government. Now, Americans, on the other hand, have proven to be obstinate people. But the battle is just as real in America. And the world, as you read the book of Revelation, you can see that the world is struggling with this idea. Will we actually obey our leaders? I don't know that we're in a place, and I'm certainly not an historian or a prognosticator of the future, to know if we're in a place where most of the world is ready to submit to world leaders. I think there's probably going to be a lot more upheaval before that might be accomplished. But in this day and age of Revelation 14 and Revelation 15, the world has pretty much gotten everyone on board. You will submit. But this small group of people who've said no and have died as a result of it. So those who've escaped, we saw in Revelation chapter 15, sing a song. The song of Moses. Verse 3, chapter 15. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the Saints. And then they sang a song to the Lamb, verse, 50, verse 4. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. We might wonder, when did these saints come to this conclusion? When they arrived in heaven? and saw the glory of God the Father and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ the Lamb? Or did they already believe it? And that's what enabled them to go through. The martyrdom brought by the wicked one. That's the question that we have to grapple with. We have to grapple with. Are, are, you know, are we following God? Are we interested in religion? Are we interested in the Bible? Are we considering what Jesus Christ means because we're hoping he's going to make our life better? Things are going to, be more, are going to go more smoothly. I'm going to be more successful. My relationships are going, to, are, going to be, are going to be much more enjoyable. And if God could just make this life better, then I'm all in. I'll give my sacrifice of my time, of my attention to God because I want it to get better. What if it doesn't get better? What if it gets worse? 
What if God rocks your world? I was talking to someone the other day who's going through a really tough and a difficult and struggling time. And I said to this person, I said, look, it's the difficult times, it's the hard times, it's our reliance upon God that prepares us for the next difficult time that's coming in the future. The reason maybe some older Christians that you know, and maybe you are part of that group of older Christians, the reason that you can handle certain stress now in your life rather easily is because God put you through stress early for which he gave you victory, and now you have a track record. Track records are great for the immediacy of today, but are we willing to say that the track record God has done in my life will carry me when something happens that I can't even anticipate? I think these martyrs in Revelation chapter 15, 1 through 4, believed in what God would do because they've experienced some of his faithfulness that when they get to heaven, they can't help but begin to sing of what they believed. That God alone is almighty. That Jesus Christ is all-powerful. And so the preparations for God's judgment against the wicked are now complete. The reaping is now about to begin. And the question we find answered in Revelation 15, 5 through 8 is, what does John see? See, he's getting this vision of this. He's allowed to see the future. What is it that he sees? Verse 5, Revelation 15. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. The temple in heaven is opened. Since the moment God met Moses in the wilderness, and that's why I brought this up with the kids' message. Since the moment God met Moses in the wilderness, access to his presence has been very limited. It's been deadly. Exodus chapter 3, verse 5 says this. Here is Moses and the burning bush. Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. We don't know what would have happened to Moses if he just walked right up to it. The fact that it was a burning bush, I think, from God's vantage point said, if I make a burning bush, he'll come close, but he won't get too close. Just because smart people don't get too close to a burning fire that they don't control. But he reminds them, this is not just some unusual occurrence in the wilderness. This is not some natural or unnatural phenomenon. This is supernatural. And you dare not come too close to my presence. When the nation then gathers at Mount Sinai, after their escape from Egypt, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 10, then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. He's preparing the people. If you're going to come close to God, you need to be prepared. For them, it started with washing their clothes. Most of us, when we go to a special event, we don't pick up the clothes that are laying in the pile on the floor with all the dirty clothes that have been stacking up there for three weeks. I know, ladies don't stack clothes for three weeks, but guys tend to. You're going to pick out something that's clean and presentable, and you're going to dress to, to, because you're honoring the occasion. You're honoring the people you're with. And what God instructs through Moses is have the people ready to honor. Verse 11. And let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Now, he's not coming down to meet John. He's not coming down to meet Ray. He's not coming down to meet Christina. He's not coming down to meet an individual. He's coming down to the entire nation. If you're going to meet two million people, you've got to be up on a podium somewhere. You gotta, you, I mean, the view's got to be up pretty high if you're going to see that. So he's going to come on top of a mountain. And they're going to gather around the base of a mountain, the two million plus people of the nation of Israel. And they're going to have washed their clothes, and they're going to have waited three days. He's giving them three days to be prepared for this coming. Verse 12. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. It doesn't say how they will die. It doesn't say who will execute them if they violate this command. It just says they will die. It will be intentional because they have been disobedient. Just like God said to Moses, 
don't come any closer. Take your shoes off. It's holy ground where I am in the burning bush. When I come down to a burning mountain, you better step back a bit. I haven't been to Yellowstone National Park since I was like six. But I saw a picture the other day of uh, Old Faithful the Geyser. And I don't know what the rules are there. I mean, some of you maybe have been there more recently. But I'm pretty sure, I know in the hot springs areas there of, of, of Yellowstone National Park, that there are boardwalks and there are fences and you're supposed to stay back a bit. Because when hot, I don't know what the temperature of the hot water is coming out of the geyser, but if it's at least boiling, spraying up hundreds of cubic feet of water, you probably don't want to have your shampoo ready. You know, you won't need soap to clean yourself to the bone. Just saying. So people stand back. And, and Old Faithful, I think, goes off, if I remember right, I mean, I was six years old, like every 67 or 70 minutes. It's on a timer, natural timer. <laughs> Not like they have, I like think the park rangers did that. You know, with the cutting of funding, it would probably go every three hours now. I don't know. But as it goes, people know when it's to blow, and they're anticipating, and they stand appropriately back. Now, in the early days, when they're first figuring this out, yeah, there's probably a couple of stupid people got a little close, didn't know what the timing was, and then they set up a sign. Hey, every 67 minutes, stand back this far because this is where it's going. This is a little bigger scale than Old Faithful. No one can enter God's presence without an invitation. Because what we find, as I was reading even to the kids earlier, Moses seems to kind of go up and down the mountain. <laughs> gets to see God face to face, but it's always an invitation. So when the tabernacle is completed, according to God's very specific instructions, God enters the camp. Notice what it says, Exodus 40, verses 34 and 35. The tabernacle has been built. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So here's Moses. This is Exodus 40. This is way past Exodus 35 and Exodus 31, Exodus 19, and all these other places in Exodus where God allows Moses to go up into the mountain, meets him face to face, gives him the commands, carves the Ten Commandments into two different sets of tablets, has all of that. Now the tabernacle's been built according to very specific instructions. Here's, the, here's the, the, the tent itself. Here's the holy of holies. Here's the veil. Here's all the stuff. They've brought everything in. They've gotten everything ready. And when God then descends upon it, Moses, who's had the opportunity to see God face to face, dare not enter. And he never enters because Moses is not one of the priests. His brother Aaron will enter into the holiest place where God dwells one day a year called the Day of Atonement. And he better do it the right way or he will die. But no one else will ever enter the Holy of Holies, the very presence of where God dwells, over the mercy seat, over the Ark of the Covenant. But now what we find in Revelation 15 in verse 6, or verse 5, is that the end of wicked man has come and the place of God's presence is opened. The temple of the tabernacle in heaven is opened. This is a representation in heaven of the place where worship and service happens. The temple in heaven. It is the center of God's holiness and it's now open and John can see that the temple has been opened. Now we realize that when Christ died on the cross, the veil of the temple... Solomon's temple that was replaced by Herod's temple, there is still a holy place, there's still an Ark of the Covenant, there's still a veil that divides it, there's still a barrier where the high priest can only go in one day a year, and when Christ dies on the cross, the veil, it says, tore itself in two, because the way is now open to God. Well, the way in heaven, just before the judgment of mankind, is now opened. The presence of God is seen. There's a reason why the Bible says again and again, particularly in the Old Testament, we're to fear God because he is the ultimate judge. And if we walk into his presence knowing that we are less than perfect, less than righteous, we realize we face judgment. 
The judgment described of every Christian in the New Testament is a judgment of fire in which God sends down fire and burns up everything that represents our life and sees how much of it survives. How much of our life is silver, gold, and precious stones, or how much of our life is wood, hay, and stubble? How much of our life? And there's an accounting of all of our life. And the fire is not the burning of our stuff. It's not our stuff that fuels the fire. It's the fire of God's judgment that burns up our stuff or leave some of it intact, for which if you are like me, we will realize in that moment that anything that's intact had nothing to do with us. Because most of the stuff that we work on, that we pursue, is still all wrapped up in our sinful selfishness, in our pride, in our ego, in our desire to get ahead. But the things that God can produce in us, like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. So when we are long-suffering and when we are loving and when we are at peace, we have to realize that was the fruit God did in us through his Spirit that we wouldn't have done on our own. That it's God working through us and in us. So Revelation 15, 6 says, And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. The seven angels of God's judgment emerge from this temple. The ultimate service for God is these angels coming out of the temple to do his work. What do they hold in their hands? The seven plagues of God's judgment. They're not identified. They're not named. There's not like a list somewhere in the Bible. Here are the seven plagues of God. You could go to the Old Testament, you could look at the plague narrative of Exodus and the Egyptians, and you could try and make some connection. But here he just states there are seven plagues. Seven being a number of completion. If God is going to bring plagues of judgment, he's going to bring the complete thing. He's going to do it once and for all. These angels have been entrusted with what I believe are God's weapons of punishment. Just as Moses held the staff of God who touched the waters of the Nile. The staff that Moses held in his hand became, in some senses, a weapon as he extended it, as he touched things according to God's instruction. Moses, when you touch the Nile with your staff, it will turn to blood. Moses, when you hold your staff above your head and the army of Israel is battling the army of Midian, the army of Israel will be victorious. But if you let the staff drop, then the tide of the war will turn. These seven angels hold the means by which God will unleash his righteous anger on man. And it says they're clothed in white. They're clothed in God's purity. It's a picture of God's holiness, the brightness of their clothing. Like Moses' face that shone bright, having seen God, and the people were fearful of it, and he had to wear a veil over his face. I think the picture of these angels coming in this bright linen is going to be frightening because of the brightness of it. Exodus 34, verse 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai that Moses did not know that his skin of his face shone while he talked with him. In Exodus 34, 11, it says Moses talked face to face with God and he didn't realize that as a result of that he was glowing. And when he came down to the people, they went, stop, don't talk to us. Cover your face. These angels, the seven, they wear the power and authority of God with the golden bands. The golden bands put them in the army of God and his judgment. They appear to be commissioned to bring God's wrath upon the earth and its inhabitants. Verse 7, then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. What does John see? God hands out his anger, his wrath. One of the four living creatures who exist before the throne of God, somehow one of these is given the responsibility to distribute God's wrath as pictured in a bowl to each of the seven angels. Now, is the bowl of wrath to be considered an equivalent to the plague? The angels possess the plague, and is that the plague is really the bowl of wrath? Well, here's a couple of questions that I thought about. 
Is the Bowl of Wrath possibly the final authorization to unleash the judgment that has already been prepared? So the, the angels hold the plagues of judgment, and now as they receive the Bowl of Wrath, it's saying it's time to go. It's the final authorization. The key code has been punched in. The judgment is to be unleashed. Can God's wrath be quantitatively packaged? Can you package God's wrath? Does he have a bowl and as he gets angry, it just fills, 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 fills? Is there seven bowls? Do they each fill at the same rate? Does one fill and he, and he just holds and then moves to the second and fills the second? See, we think in quantitative terms. Because in quantitative terms, we feel like we could maybe stop them, right? If God is building up wrath, maybe we can stop him from pouring wrath into the bowl. Maybe we can stop at the second bowl or the third bowl. We certainly don't want to get to the seventh bowl. I think the doomsday clock has a better picture of this than we typically think. See, the doomsday clock is that prediction of how close we are to the end of the world based on world circumstances. But what's interesting is the clock doesn't always move forward. Sometimes it moves backwards. Sometimes circumstances calm down, and instead of being 70 seconds to midnight, we find ourselves three minutes from midnight. What we find sometimes in the scriptures is this presentation that if mankind will repent, God will repent of the judgment he intended. One illustration would be the city of Nineveh. The city of Nineveh was wicked and evil and ready to be destroyed, and God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach against it. And Jonah, in his wisdom, in his self-satisfaction, in his self-righteousness, says, I don't want to go there. They deserve to die. He doesn't say that initially. He says that at the end of the book. They deserve to die. And I knew if I went and gave them your message, they could quite possibly turn. And I don't want them to be repentant. I don't want you to be long-suffering. I don't want you to be merciful toward these wicked people because I think they're wicked. So this morning in Sunday school, I mentioned... And uh, for those who were there, you appreciate what I said, but now I'll say it to all of you. Don't you at sometimes wish you could line up certain people? And you'd like to see certain people in our world gone. That's the selfishness of Jonah. That's the sin of Jonah. Because God in his mercy throughout the scriptures presents, I will give people an opportunity to repent and to turn. Now, what we found in Revelation 14 is they don't appear to want to. What we'll find in Revelation 16 is they won't. So these bowls filling up, I don't think, is necessarily a, a, a quantitative thing that occurs over a period of time. And, and we're at six bowls, one more to go, and then it's all over. I think God looks at the heart of man and says... It's time to judge the unrepentant heart of man. See, what we find, even in the scriptures, when God brings an untold judgment on a group of people or a person, whether it be Sodom and Gomorrah, whether it be the Egyptian army, whether it be Korah, the, family, the extended family of Korah, whether it be the people of Jericho, when he brings those untold judgments on people, whether it be the flood of Noah, God gives them ample time to know the truth, ample time to prepare, an ample witness to listen to. So Sodom and Gomorrah had Lot, who was there for years, who had risen to the point where he's one of the judges of the city. The world of Noah had 120 years of Noah's preaching. The Egyptian army got to see the 10 plagues of God unleashed on their nation. The people of Jericho had heard of what God had done for the nation of Israel for the previous 40 years. They knew the story of what was going on with the nation of Israel. So when the nation of Israel miraculously crosses the Jordan River, they're not fools, they're just rebellious and unrepentant. Except for Rahab. Except for Lot. Except for Noah. Can the anger of God be given to an angel to disperse? And why in the midst of all the doom does John remind us 
that God is eternal. That just baffled me. And it still does. So in the midst of this statement where he says that he gives them the golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever, why mention that God is eternal? Do the plagues end life? Is what, he, is what John's seeing is this, this opposites of God alive and man dies? Does God's wrath extinguish man's existence? Is that what he's trying to tell us? Does God's condemnation of man bring him to the opposite of his own nature? So here is God who lives eternally, and now man... What is the opposite of living eternally? Most people hope it's extinction. But eternal life is not, the opposite of eternal life is not elimination, extinction, or death as we think of death as extinction. It is eternal death. The character of God is eternal, not temporary. It's a great comfort to people to say, I'm going to live this life and then I die. That's really comforting. The scriptures even say, that's what the fool says. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow I die. In this moment when God is about to unleash his wrath that is full upon mankind, he reminds them, there's an eternal nature to me. So the challenge becomes for us is to not limit our perspective on this life to the non-eternal. What I mean by that is we often go through this life saying, well, in the end it'll all work out. So I can do what I want. In the end, God will all, he'll forgive us all. In the end. And the picture here in Revelation 14 is much more sobering than that. Verse 8 takes us directly back to the Old Testament, takes us directly back to the tabernacle, takes us directly back to Mount Sinai. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels was completed. God himself fills the temple with his glory, with his power. And no one dare enter his presence when he's unleashing his judgment on unrepentant man. Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 to 18. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Verse 17, And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Verse 18, Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. The temple in heaven, in Revelation 15, is filled with God's presence. No one may enter, no one may see God, no one may come near and worship or serve until the judgment of the wrath of God is complete. I want to end with reading four verses from Exodus. So what John sees is a vision of what will happen in the future. What Moses records is what they experienced. Somewhere in between is where we live. We're expected to live somewhere between Exodus and Revelation. We're expected to see God somewhere between what they see in Exodus and what John sees in Revelation. That's what we're supposed to see as we walk through life. That's what we're supposed to be envisioning as we go out of here today and we get annoyed by somebody 
or uh, we get frustrated by what's going on in our lives, or, or we start pursuing things that are, give us pleasure that may not necessarily line up with what God wants. Here's what God wants us to see. Exodus 20, 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. If God were going to talk directly to you today, what would be his topic of conversation? It would probably not be, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You're not dead yet. It might be, what are you doing? Why are you thinking such thoughts? Why are you contemplating such deeds? Why did you follow that path? So verse 20, Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So Psalm 23 says, you walk through the valley of the shadow of death and you fear no evil, for God is with you. Absolutely true. The other side of that is, fear God, because he's with you. So how does this conclude? So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. You can't fool me that Moses wasn't fearful, that Moses wasn't trembling as well. This is not Exodus 34 where his face shines because he sees God face to face. This is Moses stepping out and ready to walk back into the presence of God, not knowing what God might reveal of himself. When I say himself, I'm talking Moses. What might God reveal to me about me if he shows himself face to face? He has. He showed himself face to face to us with his word. And as we read it, we either accept it, respond to it, but we ignore it and go on about our way. Your Father, it is easy to look in your scriptures for words that would give us comfort and encouragement, that would fuel our joy and our peace, but none of that is possible without the sacrifice for sin that Jesus made for me and for everyone else here. None of that is possible other than Jesus accepting the wrath of the Father for the sin that we committed, that he bore on our behalf. Help us, Lord, to confront our own failure to follow you righteously. Help us to be more committed to allowing your word to change us. Lord, help us be in your word as much as is needed so that we can be reminded of the reflection that we should present because of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Help us not just glimpse periodically, once in a while, or when we're in trouble, but let us earnestly seek to know you so that you might reveal to us through your Spirit, to whom we will listen, what we still need to change where we still need to grow, and where you want to continue to produce fruit in our lives for your glory and not our own. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Princes and paupers, sons and daughters, Kneel at the throne of grace.
losers and winners, saints and sinners, one day we'll see his face, and we all bow down. Kings will surrender their crowns, and worship Jesus, he is the you to stand with us as we sing of blessings to the Lord our God.
worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing Your praise thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. God, I'll worship your holy name. Steve Schweitzer, will you close in prayer, please?